Hi guys, Liz Wheeler here. So when I was at NatCon down in Miami, Florida, I sat down with a really interesting journalist who was on the ground during the Kyle Rittenhouse shootings. He was actually, he provided some of the pivotal video evidence that was used when we were trying to discern the reality of what had actually happened when the left was accusing Kyle Rittenhouse of being a white supremacist murderer, and Kyle Rittenhouse was saying, nope, I was there defending the property, defending the town, and I acted in self-defense. Well, Julio Rosas is a journalist from Town Hall who witnessed everything, and I sat down and talked to him not only about what happened, but about the business of being a journalist in a situation like that, meaning we talked about post-traumatic stress disorder and how Julio has suffered that after seeing these riots, seeing these shootings, seeing these deaths, and it was a really interesting conversation, and I think it covered a part of journalism that's often not talked about, so I found it really interesting, and he also has a great book out for anybody who wants more details on um, the history, the reality of what went down. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy Julio Rosas. Hello, welcome to The Liz Wheeler Show. I'm Liz Wheeler. We're sitting here in Miami, Florida at NatCon 3. Another day of this fabulous conference, which means another ton, hours and hours of interviews with really cool people who are on these panels who are speaking. With me now is senior writer at Town Hall, Julio Rosas. Julio, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having me. So you wrote a book about your experience. It's called Fiery, But Mostly Peaceful, which, by the way, I talk about a lot of books with a lot of people. That's my favorite title. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, and that's the thing. I can't take all the credit for that. It's just CNN uh, with that kind of Yes. From Kenosha, they're the ones that gave me the idea. But it, it really, you know, I, I kind of went back and forth on, on some titles. And I re and we really decided on that one just because it was so just just the prime example of how the media, the mainstream media, was covering all the BLM and Antifa riots in, in, in the sense that they weren't really covering it, they were providing cover uh, for them, even when you, the, when you can clearly tell things are not okay, they're trying to tell you things are kind of okay. And, and that's why, that's part of the reason why I wrote the book, because, you know, up until, up until the book was published, all of my work was online, whether it's through Town Hall or through my Twitter account. And so, you know, given how big tech can be, I I wanted a physical medium. You know, it's kind of hard to to kind of ban a, a physical medium, and so it was really for just historical purposes because I went to so many places. Yeah, and that's that's I, I I think burned in my mind from the summer of 2020 with all the BLM riots is that screenshot from CNN where the reporters standing there with huge fires in the background claiming that these. BLM protests are just like a tea party. I mean, it really does encapsulate exactly what the BLM protests were. You were on the ground. You're an investigative reporter. You embedded in these protests everywhere from, you know, Portland with Antifa to Kenosha around after George Floyd, you know, around the Kyle Rittenhouse stuff. I mean, this you had to see some crazy stuff. Yeah, yeah. When it, well, and it's funny because 2020, we started out that year almost going to war with Iran. I mean, yeah. <laughs> when they attacked our embassy. I mean, that's how the year started, right? So it, it was uh, that was certainly like the 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 sign of how crazy things were going to be. And so then when George Floyd happened in Minneapolis, I you know I asked Town Hall. I said, Hey, you know, this is what I this is my specialty, uh, covering protests, covering riots. You know, send me. And they and and at the time. Uh, we weren't technically allowed because of COVID rules. We weren't technically allowed to travel uh, on on the company's dime because they didn't want kind of that liability. But credit to Town Hall, they they recognize okay, you know, like this is going to be a big story. This is important. We're going to go bad for you. Like just like go. We'll deal with the internal stuff later. And and so yeah, I mean, just even with Minneapolis, it was just it was anything. I, it was it was nothing like I had ever seen before uh, in terms of just how. Because uh, you know, I covered Charlottesville back in 2017. Um, you know, the difference with that was it was really concentrated by the park, but you could go like a couple blocks down the street, and people were still just kind of going about their Sunday. I believe that was a day, but this was totally different. I mean, the miles was com was completely affected by uh, where the protesters and riders had gathered outside the third uh, precinct at, at the police department there. So, I mean, it, it was just a complete breakdown in what we know to be a civilized society. And that, and, and this is not, and this is, this is the United States, this is a major city. And it was basically almost like a moment issue uh, a little bit because there was no law enforcement presence. Everything was thrown into chaos. By the time that I got there, the National Guard still hadn't been fully deployed. So it was really just a free-for-all. And I remember, uh, 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 
Craig Melvin, who, who was M- with MSNBC at the time, he tweeted out basically their their style guide for how to describe this. They were going to say, we're going to we're going to label these as protests with some kind of disruptions. Uh, but, you know, we're not going to call these riots, essentially. And and that was kind of the, the signal to me that, like, OK, whenever these pop up, I really need to make an effort to go there because, I mean, they were just because of all what, the buildings. What gave that, you the feeling when you saw that, when you saw from MSNBC that they weren't going to call it riots? What gave you the feeling based on what you saw on the ground that that was a lie to refuse or neglect to call it a riot? Well, because there were, since there had been so many buildings already burned around the third precinct, I mean, you, you had to wear a mask, now, not because of COVID, but because there's so much ash. There was so much dust and debris in the air that if you didn't wear it, you'd be like, you'd be coughing and sneezing um, endlessly. And so, I mean, there was, there was, uh, there were, <laughs> there were uh, some Somali men who, who had a, uh, who had a business uh, on the the strip mall that was right across the street from from the third precinct, and they had to stand guard outside their outside their internet cafe, or else people because people had been trying to break in earlier, and so they had to kind of just be out there to to ward people off and to to tell them to you know not come close to where they were. It's probably but, what they tried to get away from by coming here. R- right, exactly. And so it it was it you know am I concerned about Target or Best Buy? You know their financials. You know obviously it's still wrong to loot those places, but you know am I concerned about them? No. What what I'm kind of concerned with are the small businesses like like the immigrants and South Minneapolis, which is where a lot of this destruction took place. It is heavily, uh, you know, a lot of uh, Somalis, a lot of Latinos, uh, Native Americans, who who live in that area and have businesses, and a lot of those places were 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 wiped out. Uh, because of these mostly peaceful protests. Did you get the feeling right from the get-go being on the ground that these protests, which we now know were sponsored by Black Lives Matter and were well-funded, did you get the feeling that they were organized or spontaneous? It, it, it kind of depended on uh, the where the where the protests were taking place and it also depended on how long they lasted because uh, as, as time went on in Minneapolis, they got more and more organized. And so that's how they were kind of able to really easily by Thursday uh, overrun the third police precinct and and actually force the cops out to, so that they can set it on fire. Uh, Kenosha was a little bit kind of the same way where uh, what happened with Jacob Blake, where it was a justified police action, uh, but the immediate response was was pretty local. It was pretty spontaneous. Pretty spontaneous. But as time went on, uh, people would be coming in from Milwaukee. Uh, people would be coming in from Chicago. Uh, I I noticed that. Uh, <laughs> uh, after my time in Portland, that they would um, uh, mimic the tactics that were being used in Portland. And Portland, just to clarify, that would have been like Antifa versus in Kenosha, it would have been Black Lives Matter. Yes. And so... Do you ever notice any coordination between those two groups? I mean... I'm sure there were uh, within their within their chats because I mean they they would use Signal. Um, uh, they, they do like to advertise for their self funding with through just through PayPal and Venmo. Um, because I mean, there was even a there was even a van that came all the way from I believe it was Portland to Kenosha, and police uh, uh, arrested the drivers because they were bringing in gasoline cans uh, in, into the town. Right? I mean, so th- there was certainly uh, you know this this wasn't all spontaneous. I- I'll say that uh, the, the initial reaction w- was, but then as time went on and they were kind of testing to see what they were able to get away with, that's when we kind of saw the higher levels of, of coordination in terms of just figuring out where they're going to gather, where they're going to go. And, and Portland's a prime example of that because, I mean, they have that down to a science. And it's really interesting. And it's really kind of even more uh, weird when you have the media be like, oh, well, Antifa's just, or, or Democrats saying, oh, Antifa's just, a, uh, it's just kind of the boogeyman uh, of the right. It's like, no. Yeah, it's, what did the Democrats say? Antifa's just an idea? It's a, it's a myth. Jerry, Jerry Nadler, uh, who, who's a chairman of, of, a, of a pretty significant House committee, he's saying that it's a myth. And it's, no, it's a real organization. It's not, it's not, uh, it's, it's uh, very broken down into local cells, but that doesn't mean it's, it's not organized at, at all. And so, um, you know, from my experience in, in going to all these different places, that they 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 can be a, a real threat if they get motivated and organized enough. Talk to me about Antifa for a second, because one of the interesting phenomenons with Black Lives Matter is they do exactly what you described. They hijack spontaneous protests. In my opinion, that makes it more evil because they're exploiting the emotion that people are feeling in order to achieve their own political agenda, their nefarious political agenda. But And we've been able to trace back 
the etymology of Black Lives Matter to these these Marxists that founded the movement. And, you know, it's helped destroy that movement, honestly, to expose their hypocrisy, to expose their Marxism. We've never been able to do that with Antifa. We've never been able to trace it back to a single source or a single group of people. How come? Because it's very deliberate, uh, because they know that when they, uh, when you have kind of a a national Antifa leader, there's going to be a lot of scrutiny, especially with kind of the ideas that they want to put forth. I mean, it's not even just, it's not even just like progressivism. It's, it's this weird mixture of anarcho-communism and it's, it's really fascinating. Um, and so they, they know that if they were to get more organized on a vertical level, that it would be easier for, you know, well, and not like the FBI is going to crack down on them. They're, they're too busy dealing with uh, parents at school boards. Parents at school boards. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, let's say if there was like, you know, a, a competent federal law, a law enforcement agency like that. Uh, so they, they no, so that's what I was saying. They, they definitely are, are good at being able t- to uh, prevent law enforcement from getting their, their arms around them. Uh, and so, but then, at the same time, it doesn't even really matter because even on the local level, because as we saw in Portland, the, people get arrested, get their mugshot taken. It's like, okay, now you're done. And, it's it, like it, a badge of honor. But is yeah. that is that reality? Is there actually not organized leadership? Because I personally find that very hard to believe that Antifa would engage in the tactics that they are, the very deliberate tactics with this very odd combination of ideologies, this yeah. anarcho-communism, as you describe it, and that it wouldn't have been suggested or taught by some person, some group, some entity, some website. Yeah. So yeah, they do, they do have some websites. And and like I said, there's no national leadership, but that doesn't mean that there's no local leadership. And so they, there's, there's different groups. I mean, even Portland has a, like three to four different Antifa groups. I mean, there's a Rose City Antifa, there's a Pacific Northwest Youth Liberation Front. So it, they, they, and you know, they each kind of have their own ways of, do, of doing stuff, but um, it, and so because that they have no leader, national leadership or more of a concrete uh, vertical command structure, uh, that is also one of their biggest weaknesses. And I actually saw that uh, when I was in Portland on January 20th, uh, when they uh, were rioting, uh, just because, you know, because Joe Biden was becoming, uh, was being inaugurated that day. And so, you know, because they, we were literally, you know, I was with the, the initial crowd, they all agreed to gather at this one place. And then they just started marching, but then they had no idea where they wanted to go. And so <laughs> each kind of the different factions kind of were giving ideas and all this stuff. And it was really funny because uh, there was a transgender um, black woman who was trying to speak and 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 some of the the whiter counterparts just started walking away. And, and so they, they, uh, they're they like, hey, she's speaking, you know, how, how could you, you know, ignore her? And then they were saying, we don't care. Um, so they're, they're, as much as Antifa is a threat, and I'm not trying to downplay that, they also are just kind of comical in in, in like in, in that they're they're very uh, you know radical ideologies because you know that was you know to them to some of them they were committing this grave sin by ignoring a black transgender person, but they didn't care because they were trying to uh, carry out some actions against against the state. So it's it's, it's really fascinating. Um, but yeah, no. So it's very deliberate that they get that they break down into these very different. Uh, cells because they they don't want to have the entire organization come crumbling down if you know they were to take action if the law enforcement were to take harsher action yeah i I wonder if it would be beneficial for conservatives to try to to try to uncover even shadow leadership you know who's writing these websites who's creating these pamphlets who's sparking these ideas, because that's how, I mean, that's what we did with the Women's March. That's what we did with Black Lives Matter. That's how we expose a lot of these organizations. But I want to go back to something you said before. I want to go back to Kenosha for a second. There's a little bit of a divide in the conservative movement and the Republican Party about the role that Kyle Rittenhouse played in Kenosha. Some conservatives say, listen, he was a hero. He was out doing what police should have been doing. He was defending his his city. He was defending that which he loved, and he had an absolute right to do that. There's other conservatives who say, listen, he, in the moment, he had a right to self-defense, certainly, which means the outcome of his trial was correct, but it was unwise for him to have been involved in the first place. He was a teenager. He was going into a situation that was going to inevitably lead to the situation that did happen. You were there on the ground. Which side, which, which of these divisions of conservatism is correct? So, so for, yeah, so first and foremost, he did shoot in self-defense. Uh, I saw the second half uh, of the shooting where he shot Anthony, uh, Anthony Huber and Gage Grosskreutz. Um, what I'll say is that he, he, he... Were you there? 
for that part? Yeah, you, yeah. Saw, you saw that happen? Yeah, 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 I saw that happen. And so he definitely did what he needed to do in order to to survive and, and get out of the situation. And that's the part that I think the Republican Party is unified on. Right. And so then, you know, for me, I don't really I don't, I don't really care about the debate, whether he's a hero or not. Um, I think, you know, because like there's some also people who say like he shouldn't have gone kind of on a victory tour after his trial with like going to Turning Point uh, uh, to their, to their conference a couple months later uh, and going on all these interviews and doing all this stuff. And and to me, I think like that is absolutely, that's a wrong thing to think because you you have to think about it from his perspective. He uh, was in jail for this before the trial, um, that he was getting slandered, you know, six ways a Sunday. He was being called a white supremacist. He was being called a terrorist and there's all, there's all this kind of crazy stuff. And he couldn't say anything about it because he didn't want to potentially, uh, ruin his chances by saying something wrong uh, at, at the trial or, or prior to the trial. And so for me, I think it, it was totally within his right to take a victory lap because he, I mean, he had a very good chance or maybe not such a good chance, but he, there was a possibility of him going to jail for a very, very long time or prison for, for, for a very justifiable action. So I think, you know, to call him a hero or, you know, to get into this debate about whether or not he should or should not have been there, I think it completely misses the point because the real fault lies on the local and state officials. True. That abdicated their authority. They were trying to placate the mob yet again. I mean, the whole reason why the crowd got pushed into where the area where the armed civilians were at, including Rittenhouse, was because the rioters were attacking the county courthouse. I mean, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. And so, I mean, when I was there covering the trial, and I was seeing the uh, assistant district attorney trying to twist what Kyle was doing, completely leaving out the fact that the riders were attacking the very building that we were in just like a year prior. I mean, it was yeah. it was so ridiculous. So by 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 conservatives kind of getting into this debate, whether or not he's a hero or should or shouldn't have been there, I think it it it. It, 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 it ignores the fact that where the real problem lies. And the I, re- I get and the, that. I think that the that's a really good point. On the authorities. Of course it does. Of course it does. The reason I think that the debate is an uncomfortable debate, right? Because it, because the person is in the public eye, right? Kyle Rittenhouse is there. He's a real person. But the reason the debate, I think, or the conversation is important is because it helps conservatives understand how to react in these situations in the future. Mm-hmm. Black Lives Matter and Antifa are going to use the same tactics that they have used already because law enforcement didn't stop them. And they were, they'll be emboldened because they didn't face accountability. And so the conversation should be, it should be, it should be a thoughtful conversation about, okay, well, how do conservatives respond in these situations in the future where their property and their cities are under assault and law enforcement isn't, isn't doing anything? Should they do what Kyle Rittenhouse did or should they not do what Kyle Rittenhouse did? And, and maybe that's a conversation for a different day. And maybe it's too, maybe it's uncomfortable, but I, I think there's some value in it as long as, and I take your point, as long as we don't allow that to distract from law enforcement being, being derelict in their duty, not, not securing the city that they're supposed to. Yeah. And, and so I don't know, I, I don't know what, what the deal was that night. Cause there were extra law enforcement agencies. I mean, I saw, I saw Wisconsin counties like that were from, from the other side of the state. So it's not like it was just the Kenosha Police Department. It was not just the National Guard or, or the Kenosha County Sheriff's Office. There was multiple agencies. So I, I really think if they really wanted to uh, clamp down on these rioters, I think they could have, but either they didn't have the orders to do that or they didn't want to put themselves on the line. Because they didn't they, have the support because the politicians. They didn't, right, exactly. So, and, and, and that's very dangerous because now we're seeing the, the effects of that with the high crime in, in our cities. I mean, I mean, it was the whole situation in Memphis. Yeah. I mean, just back to back. I mean, we had a woman kidnapped. We had uh, this guy going around targeting white people. It looked like in live streaming it on, on Facebook. I mean, it, it's ridiculous what is being allowed to happen. I mean, it, it, we have these progressive district attorneys. Uh, you know, my home state of Illinois is, has passed this ridiculous law that's going into effect uh, next year. That's basically just just going to let even more. Uh, criminals out onto the streets with no bail or, you know, there, there's going to be no pre-trial detainment. I mean, it's, it's, and it all, a lot of it stems back to what happened in 2020 because, well, we need to do this because racial equity and, and all this stuff. And who suffers the most from this? It's going to be black and brown people. It, 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 I, I just, and that's why I continue, you know, reporting on, on cities. I, I spent the 4th of July weekend covering shootings in Chicago 
In that short time, a police officer was shot in the line of duty. The next morning, an officer took her own life. A 10-year-old boy was shot in the leg when he was in his bedroom. Uh, I mean, this I mean, this is a reality. This is a reality that a lot of our Americans are facing today. And Democrats and people in the media, they say, no, 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 we, we need to continue on with with these policies. And, and, and this is not, and, you know, having been on the ground uh, since then, uh, it's just, it, that's, that's not a reality that, that should be taking place, but it is. It is. Can I ask you a personal question? Yeah. You're embedded in these protests. I mean, you saw, you saw lives being taken. Do you have PTSD from this? <laughs> yeah. So I, I, uh, the, the last chapter of my book uh, talks a lot about kind of the personal effects and kind of the things that I went through because, um, in the moment, uh, you know, when, when, uh, when 2020 was happening, it was just, it was just go, 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 go. I mean, I was, I was away from home a minimum every other week. I was, I was always going from place to place because there's just so many things happening. So I didn't ha have time to really process what was, what was going on. And, and it wasn't until it started to get colder uh, it, it, in the country. And so, you know, as much as uh, these uh, so-called revolutionaries like to like, oh, the revolution is going to be televised. As soon as it dips below like 40 degrees, they're like, okay, we're going to go home. <laughs> go to our parents' basement. We, we're like... <laughs> exactly. It's warmer. It's warmer down there. Um, so at, at that point, it started to catch up to me. Um, and, and, it, and it manifested itself in, in, in having nightmares. I would, I would rarely dream. You know, after I got older, I, I rarely dreamed. Uh, and now I was having consistent nightmares, just bad dreams. My sleep was really messed up. I just in general, just kind of, I would always feel um, on, on edge. And, and like, admittedly, I did, I did kind of lean into uh, alcohol to try to kind of cope with that. Um, I kind of pulled back fr from, from doing that recently, but uh, it, it did have an effect on me. And, and, and at first I didn't want to accept that because uh, coming from a, uh, you know, having served in the Marine Corps Reserves, you know, a, a lot of times I would hear from uh, my sergeants and, 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 and uh, people up in my chain of command, uh, hearing their experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, 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 you know, look, as bad as, you know, a lot of these cities became, uh, in 2020, they, they didn't, uh, or become, they didn't, uh, become full fledged war zones. Uh, cause there's in war zones, there's just a lot more death. It, don't get me wrong. It kind of looked like it at some points, especially like Minneapolis with so many kind of bombed out and burned I out. Heard it smelled like it too. Yeah, it, 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 the smell was just, it just smoke. I mean, it just, you're, you're just constantly inhaling smoke. Um, so I was trying to, I was trying to not kind of be like, kind of like, woe is me type situation because I did voluntarily go to these places. And, you know, I was kind of asking for it. And so I, I didn't want to kind of then like, well, I don't want to suffer the kind of consequences from that. So I was kind of in denial for, for quite a bit of time. And so, but then finally I had to accept, okay, I, I do have post-traumatic stress from this. Like, it's okay. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with admitting that. So it's been a process and, and, and now it's kind of more, um, having to deal with this kind of sense of boredom um, because as, as devastating and as, uh, you know, stressful covering those events are, uh, it, it's also very, very fun. I mean, there's an adrenaline rush there. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an emotional roller coaster when, you, when you're out on the ground and everyone's going, you know, haywire. So now, you know, thankfully, uh, you know, we don't have these kind of rides that are happening every other week uh, today. And so, and so now just kind of thinking about, uh, okay, how do I, how do I deal with this, this new sense of boredom where, where the boredom is no, like normalcy, right? And so it's, it's kind of hard coming back into that. And that's something that I'm still having to kind of, uh, work through, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't change, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't not do that all over again because it was important. Uh, it was really important to, to highlight the destruction and it was important to highlight, uh, the impact. Uh, the immediate impact. And then you know, now my mission uh, has been to document the, the, the longer lasting uh, effects. And, and, you know, I think things will get better, but I think, unfortunately, they're going to have to get worse before people realize that we need law and order. We need uh, not just uh, police departments being funded, but we need prosecutors who are actually willing to prosecute people who, uh, you know, they're, they're, that's not to say that, you know, no justice system is perfect, uh, but what we're but what we're trying to do now as a country is overcorrect. We're overcorrecting it, and 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 you know, black and brown people uh, are are dying right now at a, at a rate that maybe they wouldn't have to, uh, and they're going to continue 
until people start to to wise up and you know hopefully it's sooner rather than later it's i mean i can it's fascinating it's also to bring this full circle this is the result of a mainstream media that has a deliberate political agenda that aligns with the rioters a media that refuses to report the facts refuses to acknowledge the reality and instead displays and airs propaganda this is the result of it. Independent journalists like you have to go in and correct the record. And I appreciate, on behalf of the American people, I really appreciate your work. I, it makes me sad to hear the trauma that you've experienced. I'm happy that you've been able to find a way to cope with it in a healthy way. Um, but if we had a media as a whole that was committed to the truth, then maybe we wouldn't be, maybe we wouldn't even be facing the riots that we, that we are facing. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, 2020 was just such a unique year because, I mean, with, you know, George Floyd was the spark, but we, you know, we had COVID, the early days of COVID where, you know, it was still kind of, you know, we didn't know exactly how that was going to turn out. And then we also had a presidential election with a very polarizing guy. You either love him or you absolutely hated his guts. So um, you know, I think, you know, even if you just took one of those situations away, I don't think it would have been as bad as it did because there have been situations since 2020 where there was... Uh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe there was an unjustified police action or there was a justified police action. It just looked bad on camera. Uh, but there has been much in the way of of rights. There might have been some protests. There might have been. So, you know, I'm not sure a kind of, you know, maybe the, I think it was also because after the Derek Chauvin trial where he was found guilty, I think that took the kind of the rage out finally. Um, but, you know, kind of looking to the future, it's really concerning that just how much power the rioters were able to to have. And they know that. They, they know. And so if the conditions are just right again, like say, I don't know, maybe Donald Trump wins again in 2024, um, they might try to mobilize and try to do something again because they know that they have the media on their side, they have the, 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 the political elite uh, on their side. So um, we're, we're, in a, we're in a scary time. Like right now, like I said, there's a lull, but that's not to say that it can't happen again. And that's probably the most concerning part about mm-hmm. it all. Uh, so on Twitter, people can follow you at Julio underscore Rosas. 11, yes. Yeah, 11. Yeah. 11, yes. Yeah. Okay, say it correctly for me. <laughs> uh, Julio underscore Rosas 11. Okay, and I, I encourage everybody, follow him on Twitter. He's a great follow. Uh, get his book, Fiery But Mostly Peaceful. Thank you for sitting down with me today. This was a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. And for everyone watching, if you want exclusive early access to interviews just like this one, you can join us at lizwheelershow.com slash locals. If you use my promo code access, you can watch for free for the first month of your annual subscription. That's lizwheelershow.com slash locals. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I'm Liz Wheeler. already give this video a thumbs up hit the subscribe button below and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video